So hello everyone, thank you all for coming this evening. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the third installment of the Social Prescribing webinar series. Today, in collaboration with Park Run and the RCGP, we are welcoming Dr. Simon Tobin and Professor Steve Hake, who will be discussing the Park Run practice movement and example of social prescribing in action. We're very thankful to Alice and the team at RCGP for their support of the event and to Chrissy Wellington and our speakers representing Park Run. So Simon and Steve will both deliver their presentations and then there will be 15 minutes allocated for questions at the end of both their presentations. Please direct all questions to the speakers on the chat and Leah and I from the Social Prescribing Scheme will be monitoring the chat and posing questions to speakers towards the end of the session. You can ask questions via the chat function or via the Q&A function, um, which is anonymous. As the RCGP are using the webinar feature, you will automatically be muted, so, so, so no need to worry about accidentally unmuting yourselves. The session is being recorded and being uploaded onto the RCGP YouTube channel. So before I hand over to the speakers to introduce themselves, we'll be starting today's session with a quick poll. So let's launch the poll. So you should see this pop up on your screens. So I'll give you about 30 seconds to vote on that. Okay, there we go. You should be able to see the results of that poll. So we have 72% saying yes and 28% saying no. Okay, so thank you everyone for voting. I will now be handing over to Dr. Simon Tobin, our first speaker, to introduce himself. All right, can you hear me all right, Daisy? Just give me a thumbs up or... Yeah, we can hear you. Fantastic. So firstly, thank you, Daisy, and to the team at the Social Prescribing Champion Scheme and to the Royal College of GPs for organising this, this event. And thanks to all of you guys for, for joining us and taking the time to listen to me and to Steve bang on about our favourite topic, which is basically how Park Run can make the world a healthier and a happier place. So just by way of, of introduction, um, I'm Dr. Simon Tobin. I'm an NHS GP in Southport, where I've worked for about 30 years. I'm also a Park Run Ambassador for Health and Wellbeing, and that's an unpaid role. I do it voluntarily. Um, and so I'm here because I'm passionate about Park Run and the amazing changes and the potential for Park Run to transform people's lives. I'm not here because anybody's paying me to say this stuff. But Park Run is absolutely committed to supporting the process of social prescribing. And so this seminar is a really important part of our work with medical schools and the wider public health community. So I thought it would be a good idea to start off by explaining a little bit about Park Run and its origins and to take you back to a dreary day in October in 2004. Okay. So a guy called Paul, Paul Sinton Hewitt, was a keen runner and he was struggling mentally having lost his job and was suffering an injury which would mean that he couldn't run. And he wanted a way to connect with his friends and so he invited a few of them down to Bushy Park in London to do a 5k run. So Paul said go to 13 of his mates, he pressed the start button on his stopwatch and he timed them all as they ran 5k. He compiled the results with a pen and paper and then everyone headed for the cafe for a coffee and a chat. And on that day, Paul gave a prize for the first finisher and for the final finisher. Inclusivity and equality in, were embedded in the concept of Park Run right from the very start. So what is Park Run? Well, Park Run is a UK based charity supporting the delivery of free weekly timed 5K events, Park Runs, which are held every Saturday morning, week in, week out. And they're held in areas of open space. We've also got 2K events or junior park runs for 4 to 14 year olds and their families, which are held on a Sunday morning. Park runs are delivered by the community for the community. 
They were organised by local teams of volunteers without whom Parkrun would not exist. Every single event is free to take part in and people can participate in whatever way they want, whether that's to walk, jog, run, volunteer, or simply come along and watch or just join people in the cafe for coffee afterwards. So in this respect, not much has changed since that day in 2004. But in terms of the numbers, things are very different. We now have over a thousand events in the UK with over 700 5K events on a Saturday morning and well over 300 junior five, uh, 2K events on a Sunday morning. Unsurprisingly, the growth of events has also brought, brought about a growth in participants. At its height pre-COVID, we saw 200,000 people taking part in events across the UK every single weekend. Now, if you think about the London Marathon, what's that, 40, 45,000 people on one day of the year, once a year? Well, Parkrun, we're seeing 200,000 people week in, week out, every week of the year prior to lockdown. In total, since 2004, 2.7 million people have participated in the UK with 120,000 new participants in 2020 alone. And bearing in mind, we obviously locked down in, in March. But it's not just in the UK that we have a growing footprint. We have events in 23 countries across the world. From the plains of South Africa to the freezing tundra of the Baltics and everything else in between. So Park Run really is a global phenomenon. We now have over 2,200 events globally, with Australia and South Africa regularly clocking the largest in terms of participant numbers. Unfortunately, but obviously understandably, in March last year, we had to close every single one of our 2,200 events. Thankfully, some territories have now reopened, with over 400 events in, and in excess of 60,000 people taking part in a park run last weekend. They're operating under our COVID framework, which outlines clearly how we minimise risk. Although UK events are yet to reopen, we're hopeful it's not going to be too long. Um, and I, for one, I just can't wait to, to get back to my local park run. And for me, it's not that I'm really missing the opportunity to, to do a 5K. I run 5K a couple of times a week. What I miss, personally, is everything else that comes with Parkrun. For me, and, and for many others, Parkruns are a social opportunity. They're a chance to connect with others, with people in, in green spaces, and to build friendships, and to move in the open air, and to build self-confidence, and self-esteem, and to gain new skills. Every Saturday morning when I come home after a park run, I'm just buzzing and I'm just full of happy hormones and, and just beautifully set up for the rest of the weekend. So in park run, we have a model for self-care and a means of tackling the root causes of ill health and inequalities at considerable scale and at very, very low cost. So park run has been described as the most significant public health initiative of the 21st century. Even the WHO referred in its, uh, to Park Run in its Global Action Plan on Physical Activity. Given the impact it has on health and well-being, it's no surprise then that Park Run has the stated mission to create a healthier and a happier planet. The whole Park Run organisation is devoted to making the world healthier and happier. And if we simply stuck to delivering events in accordance with the existing model, then I've no doubt we would achieve great things. However, at Park Run, we also look at what we can achieve through this single standardized event delivery model. And we see if we can layer on additional impact, focus on those who may benefit from Park Run, but might ordinarily be excluded. Like those with chronic health conditions or disabilities, or people from areas of social deprivation, minority ethnic groups, women and girls, or those in custody. This means looking closely at the registration and participation data, and also augmenting this with further research, both internal and external. And Park Run used this insight to build a picture to hold ourselves to account and to come up with solutions to enable us to better engage with our target groups. And this is something that Steve's gonna talk about when I've finished. It also means developing and implementing product, uh, projects in collaboration with other organisations, often outside of the physical activity sector, including public health in order to support the growth of social prescribing. 
A really important example of this is the Park Run Practice Initiative that we launched with the Royal College of GPs in 2018. So what is this initiative? Well, it's a, it's a social prescribing project which encourages GPs to link with local park run events and to become certified park run practices. The practices commit to signposting patients to park run as well as staff taking part themselves. Instead of being imposed from the top down, this initiative was the brainchild of clinicians like me and others who were already signposting patients to our local park run events in an informal way. And I'd noticed that when I started suggesting park run to some of my patients, I'd, I'd seen some amazing results. And I'll share with you a couple of, of good news stories of patients of mine in a little bit. In fact, some practices were actually setting up park runs themselves, like my friend Dr. Ollie Hart at Sloan Medical Centre in Sheffield, which set up Graves Park Run, and another group of GPs in Penzance set up, the, um, set up a park run down in Cornwall. At the national level, the Royal College of GPs and Park Run HQ provided the framework to scale up this local level process of social prescribing. We've provided a toolkit that provides additional support, advice and resources, but practices and park runs are encouraged to be creative and come up with new and fresh ideas for making it work. To get involved, we first encourage practice staff to go down to their local event, experience park runs for themselves and chat to the volunteer team. The practice can then uh, register to be an official park run practice via the park run practice website. They then sent a certificate which can be printed and displayed proudly in their waiting rooms. It's self-declared trust-laden process rather than being strictly adjudicated. And the benefits are significant. This initiative has, has been run on a shoestring with no external support or investment. So despite of, or perhaps because of the resource constraints, the initiative has been a huge, huge success with over 1500 practices signing up in the UK. And I reckon that's about 20% of UK general practice practices have signed up. It's now been rolled out in Ireland and we're due to launch in Australia later this year. The initiative has won loads of na uh, national awards and is supported by NHS England, Public Health England, and it offers a brilliant example of social prescribing between public health and the physical activity sector, which has enabled both organisations to achieve far more than either could have ever done alone. The initiative has been evaluated by Jo Fleming and her team at Warwick Medical School and the results are published in the British Journal of General Practice and the Journal of Public Health. We've been absolutely overwhelmed with demand from across primary and secondary care to replicate this um, initiative in other sectors and we're trying to support all these different sectors of public health to promote Parkrun and to take part themselves. Working with medical schools and medical students is a really important part of this. And we're, we really do welcome the opportunity, Steve and myself, to share the information about Park Run and explain how we can support efforts to grow social prescribing. One of the medical schools nearest to me, Liverpool, is linked with their local Park Run and their GP society regularly organises events where they go across to their nearest Park Run. And I'd love more medical schools and universities to link directly with their, their park runs to promote health and well-being for their staff and for their students. So before I hand over to Steve, I'd like to share a couple of real life social prescribing stories with you to just demonstrate how effective social prescribing can be and park run in particular can be in transforming lives. So I want to tell you about two patients of mine, both of whom have given consent to share their stories and to share their images with you. First of all, this is this is Eileen. I'm, I'm really fond of Eileen. I've known her for 30 years since she moved to Southport from Newcastle, fleeing a, a broken marriage with a young daughter. And I suspect many of you might know people like Eileen. She suffers from low self-esteem, low confidence. She has panic attacks and anxiety. At times she gets depressed and has had, often had antidepressants. And at times she turns to alcohol to try and solve the problem, which of course it doesn't. And Irene came to see me two or three years ago now and she said she was fed up with these cycles that just repeating themselves again and again. And she wondered, was there anything that I could suggest that might stop this happening? And I said to her, well, had she actually thought about getting involved with Part Run? 
And she looked at me like I was mad. Um, but actually, after a bit of reflection, she said she had a couple of friends who were coming down to our local park run and had asked her to come to. And so maybe she, she would give it a go that Saturday. So that Saturday, she came round and she jogged her 5K, mixture of jogging and, and walking. And she finished with just an enormous smile beaming from ear to ear. So this is what Eileen had to say. Those first scary weeks when the team at the finish cheered and encouraged me, I felt like a superstar. I've now entered the Great North Run. And of course, for Eileen, a Geordie, the Great North Run is something that's really, really special to her, an event that she'd known about all her life, but never in a million years had dreamt that somebody like her would actually be able to take part in. So I didn't hear about Eileen for a bit, but then about six months later, she sent me a text, she sent me a photo. I did it. From feeling very low to a half marathon via park run. Thank you so much. And that's an amazing achievement for, for Eileen. And she was, she was kind of transformed by that. When I saw her, she was just, just, um, just more confident and not so much swagger, but she just, uh, her self-esteem had gone up. There was a bit more of a can-do attitude. Um, she was, didn't spend so much time looking into herself, was, was looking for opportunities now. And so I was even more thrilled when about six months later, she sent me another photo. Now, this is Eileen at a, a charity project in Malawi that takes um, people out from the UK to help build schools and educate disadvantaged children in rural um, Malawi. And this is a project that Eileen had been invited to go on for years. And every single year as it got towards the summer, she, you know, she was tempted to go, but then she thought, oh no, I'll, I'll just get in the way. I'll, I'll cock it up. I won't be any use. I'll just bring everybody down with my low mood. Oh, what's, what's the point? And she'd never been. But buoyed up by that success that had started with Parkrun and the confidence that she'd built and the sense of inclusivity and, and that, that can-do attitude that it fosters, she felt, well, what the hell? I'll give it a go. And she came back from that trip to Benawi absolutely transformed. She said, I've fallen in love with it. The kids there are amazing. I know I'm going to go back there every single year for as long as I possibly can do. Um, and it, it's completely, completely transformed her life. I'd also like to just tell you about Kelly. Kelly, another patient of mine for, again, about 30 years. Um, and I'm really, really fond of. Um, Kelly was born blind and was educated at St Vincent's Blind School in Liverpool, one of four blind schools in the country. And I was chatting to Kelly one day and we just got onto exercise, as I often do. And she was saying she was getting a bit fed up with her exercise class, that she used to go to a class twice a week. And she said, well, at the start, they all go for a warm up. And when they all go for a warm up, they all go for a jog. But they're worried about me bumping into a lamppost or tripping over. So they put me on the rowing machine um, so I can't come to any harm. And she felt a bit patronized and a bit humiliated by that. And Kelly is an amazing woman. She's fluent in, in Braille. She's genius with IT. She knows tons about apps for visual impairment. She went on to uni. She's a journalist, um, as well as many other, many other interests. And so I said to her, well, had she ever thought about running? And she said, well, she'd never really run outside. She'd tried a couple of times on a treadmill holding onto the side indoors, but she'd never run outdoors before at all. And I said, well, you know, what would you, you know, would you fancy a go? And, you know, astonishingly, you know, she was up for it. And I said to her, well, I've just trained as a guide for um, visually impaired people. And I was looking for somebody to practice on. So seize the opportunity. Um, and I said, did she fancy coming down to Southport Park Run that next Saturday? And um, uh, yeah, brave, ballsy girl that she is. She said, Let, you know, let's do it. So I picked her up from her home, took her down to Southport Park Run. And this is the two of us at her very first park run in Southport. And it was a fascinating experience for, for both of us. It was my first proper time guiding and her first time running outside. She said at St. Vincent's, they, they didn't really do PE. They're, they're much, much better nowadays. But when she was a kid, they used to walk around the playground in an anti-clockwise direction around the edge of the, um, the playground so they didn't bump into each other. Um, so that first time at Southport Park Run was amazing. 
uh, and we, we set we set off and about three times across the course we had to stop and just walk for a bit for Kelly who's, who's actually reasonably fit to just get her breath back and it was only afterwards when I was talking to her about what was happening, she said she, she hadn't moved through air and through space so quickly before. So all those sensations um, coming all at once, the smell, the sound, the dogs, the people, the crowds, the footsteps, was just freaked her out a few times. We just had to walk, she got her breath back, and then she said, let's go again, and we, we ran a bit more. This is what Kelly had to say. It's really difficult to describe to anyone who can see just what it feels like to suddenly not have a cane in your hand. The sense of achievement it gives you when you do take that leap of faith. It's such a lovely experience to be running through the park on a Saturday morning, feeling the fresh air hit my face. Kelly finished that first park run in 45 minutes. Pretty good for a first go. But when I spoke to her afterwards, she said she was really frustrated. And I said, well, why on earth are you frustrated? And she said, because I know I can go faster. I'm really disappointed. I had to stop three times. And I said, OK, well, you know, why don't you come back next week? So she came back next week and I fixed her up with my friend Mike, who was also a, 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 a guide runner as well. And they knocked a couple of minutes off her park run time. She set a personal best that, that next week. Kelly came back for 13 successive weeks and for 13 successive weeks she ran a PB. Now I've never seen another another runner do that week after week after week. 13 successive personal bests. She now regularly runs around Southport Park Run under 25 minutes. And a bit like Eileen earlier, she's gone on to, to bigger and better things. Local 10Ks, half marathons. I then got this wonderful photo mate Mike, now her partner. So love has blossomed at Parkrun as well as Kelly's running ability. This is at the end of the London Marathon. They've now done two London marathons. They've cycled London to, to Brighton. And all this has started because of that first run at Southport Parkrun. Kelly's life has, has completely changed for the better. So I'm hoping that you'll agree that physical activity and park run in particular is just some of the best medicine that any of us can, can prescribe. So I'll hand you over to, to Steve now and we'll be available to take questions at the end. Thank you. Right, so my turn now. Um, I defy anybody not to have a tear in their eye uh, with those uh, stories uh, there. Um, so let me just set this up. Um, I mean, one thing I, I do find is the, uh, with Parker research, uh, one thing I find about it is that I do find myself uh, tearing up an awful lot when I hear about these amazing stories. So um, I'm, my presentation's a little bit drier than, than Simon's. And so as an academic, I want to find out uh, what's going on, what's the truth, I want to find out what's bad as well as what's good. Um, so that can be kind of independent, not on objective uh, about what's going on with Parkrun. But I have to say, uh, you know, I am an absolute Parkrun advocate. So it can be a little bit tricky uh, at times uh, to be totally uh, objective. But uh, let me tell you about what we did. So we, we asked these kind of these basic questions. What motivates people to go to Parkrun the first time? and what's the impact of Parkrun on their health and happiness. So um, we did a survey back in 2018. Uh, as Simon said, Parkrun collect an awful lot of data at registration. They collect uh, uh, obviously date of birth, uh, gender. Um, we ask about activity, how much activity have you done in the last four weeks of 30 minutes or more. And that goes from less than 30 minutes, uh, 130 minutes, 230 minutes, 330 minutes, 430 minutes, uh, four or more 30 minutes. And so, and these ones down at the less than 30 minutes of physical activity a week are what we call inactives. Uh, it's the, you know, the, the uh, chief scientific medical officer's uh, guidance. Um, and then we also, uh, from postcode, we can figure out which part of the world they live in in terms of deprivation. And so we have a, a thing called index of multiple deprivation that we can derive from postcode. And that gives us a, more, a, a guess about the environment that those people uh, live in. 
So we did this survey back in 2018. We sent it out to as many park runners as we could. Whoops, sorry, let me just go back. Um, it would look something like that. Um, I want to add that uh, Dr. Alice Bullis and Dr. Helen Quirk uh, did an amazing job on this survey, pulling it together, uh, the wording. You know, if any of you done any surveys, the wording is absolutely crucial. Uh, and we also had a lot of help from Chrissy Wellington and Mike Graney uh, at Parkrun as well in, in its development. So we ended up with just, yeah, just over 60,000 survey returns. Um, and you, you can kind of see there we had 11 questions, um, sorry, 47 questions, and we ended up with 11 million answers uh, or pieces of data. So we kind of overdid it a little bit on, on the questions. But despite that, parkrunners are really keen. And we asked them at the end, have you got anything else that you might want to say? So bear in mind, the average time to fill up the survey was 22 minutes. And even at the end of that, we had people telling us all their little stories. And I'll share some of those. Their stories exactly like the, the stories that, that um, Sam has told you there. And just to get a feeling for how many words 600,000 words is, it's equivalent, well, it's more than War and Peace, uh, in fact. So we have our very own park on War and Peace uh, that we have to analyze. So um, why do people first go to park run? So let's look at this motivation question. There's the question. What motivated you to first participate at Parkrun as a runner or walker? We also ask about volunteers as well, because you can go to Parkrun just as a volunteer if you wanted to as well. And we asked them to tick a maximum of three. And this was the list uh, we gave them. Things like physical health, mental health, uh, managing my weight, competing with others. Um, if that list didn't suffice, then we, they also gave the option of, you know, anything else. And of course, park runners being park runners, they like to write down what they're thinking. And we ended up with another 14,000 words on top of the 600,000 words we had already just about, about motives. So let's see what we found out. Let's see what we found out. So this is the percentage, this is proportion that answered the, the, the question and put down this, these particular motives. So you can see there over 55% said fitness. Physical health was next in the list, about you know, 30, 37%. Sense of personal achievement. I want to go and achieve something. Um, to get a recorded five time for a 5K. Some people just want to turn up to a 5K, get a time and see how they're doing. 20% said the weight management, and then we have friends or family encourage me to, to train for another event. And actually mental health surprisingly really quite low down as a motive that people put down. So let's see how uh, the difference between males and females. So uh, just a reminder, this is 16 plus. So the survey was only adult 16 plus. So here we have males and here we have females. And so what you see is males, 16 and over, are a little bit more interested in fitness uh, than females, a little bit more interested in physical health than females. Uh, in terms of this sense of personal achievement, women much more interested than males in uh, this sense of personal achievement. And then everything else is roughly, roughly the same. So um, I said we could figure out if people came from deprived communities or not. Uh, deprived areas. And uh, if we look at those, um, people from deprived uh, neighbourhoods are, you know, less interested in fitness, you know, equally interested as females as in physical, physical health, about average for sense of personal achievement. And again, everything is about the same as, as everyone else. What about inactives, people who were not doing any physical activity and now have turned up to parkrun to say, uh, to, to do something, um, uh, some physical activity. So uh, here we've got fitness. They are less interested in fitness and much more interested in physical health. So those people who are previously inactive are thinking about their physical health and are doing park run uh, because of that. The sense of personal achievement, pretty high actually compared to other people. And, and actually this challenge, getting a recorded time for 5K. People are doing couch to 5K. I want to do a 5K, I need that challenge. Weight management, a little bit more interested in weight management for the, the inactive uh, community. Uh, and actually going down here, this is interesting, training for another event, not interested, and actually mental health, not so much interested in mental health, much more interested in physical health. 
That's not to say it's the same for everyone. It's just uh, what we're seeing as a cohort, should we say. And then let's look at if those people are inactive, living in deprived neighborhoods. And these are people who really struggle to do physical activity for many, many reasons, lifestyle, environment, security, and so on. And what we're seeing here is they're the least interested about fitness, pretty interested on physical health, pretty interested about having this sense of personal achievements and getting that time of a 5K, probably the most interested cohort about weight management, their friends and family have encouraged them to do something, but interesting again, not so interested in the mental health aspect, but we'll see um, what the impact is in a little while. So um, why do people go to Python? What, what do they actually say? We've got 600,000 words, we've got 2,000 people who answered uh, motives in their own words. So what did they say? Well, okay, here's one. The first time I ever did it, my mum dragged me there and I burst into tears midway through in front of my super healthy dad. <laughs> so there's a, a young lady just being dragged there um, as the motive for going. Uh, but here equally they're around. Uh, my daughter harasses me. So there's a mother going because her daughter harasses her. And then here's another one. A, a friend bet me I couldn't run 5K before I turned 40. Uh, my husband promised me fabulous new trainers. Yes, really, lol. And I was encouraged by Paul Sinton Hewitt to take part. Well, aren't we all? You know, Simon's just said he started it off. We've all been encouraged by Paul Sinton Hewitt, but someone there, uh, you know, took the word from Paul himself. And then my postman told me about it. Fantastic. Postman going around spreading the message. What you see from that, actually, is a theme people are being told about parkrun by other people. You don't see parkrun advertising on billboards or on TV or anything. It's word of mouth. And it's this personal advocacy which has kind of sold parkrun to the masses. And I think you have that a role there as well in telling people about parkrun because people really can benefit from it. So let's go on to that benefit then. So what's the impact um, of parkrun? I should add all these pictures on my local parkrun in Sheffield and Cliff Park, pictures taken by the fantastic George Carmen. Um, so here's the question we ask, the impact of running or walking at parkrun, thinking about the impact of parkrun on your health and well-being. to what extent has running or walking at parkrun changed? And then we've got this list, physical health, mental health, ability to control your weight, happiness, and the list goes, goes down. And we give people the option of going from no impact down to much worse or no impact up to much better. Um, I should add all these questions with these long lists, uh, each person gets the order in a random order um, by, by the Qualtrics software that we send it out on. So people don't see the list, the same list uh, order each time. So, okay no impact, I'm going to say that mostly people answer no impact, better or much better in our survey. And the worst, much worse is a really actually a tiny percentage, about a half a percent. So what I will actually just show you now is the proportion that say better or much better. And just assume that the remainder, remainder is no impact. So it's 50% better or much better than the remainder is 50% and it's no impact. So let's see what they say. So here's our full 60,000 people. Um, what's the impact of parkrun on? Uh, oh, sorry, running or walking at parkrun. And about 90% say the sense of personal achievement has been improved. That's the first thing that comes out, this sense of personal achievement of doing something like parkrun. Fitness is right up there. Physical health is right up there. Over 80% saying their physical health is better. Here's key. Here's an absolute key. Nearly 80% saying their happiness is better or much better. Next in line, amount of time spent outdoors. People are spending more time outdoors when they're involved in parkrun. Uh, enjoying competing actually and I think a lot of people are quite surprised by that though that's not a motive for me joining but actually you know I quite enjoy this competing thing with my friends with myself and so on how much you feel part of community is is a really important one again more than 70 percent saying that here you go interesting mental health 70 percent of people saying that the mental health is improved by going to parkrun 
uh, and Simon talked about confidence um, uh, with his uh, his patients. Uh, Sixty percent or so improving uh, confidence, and really quite important here. Well, see, this is important for females: your ability to be active in a safe environment. So those are the kind of the top ones. The, the others kind of go off uh, on the screen to the uh, the, the right hand side. So. Let's look at males and females. Just look at the differences. Okay, sense of personal achievement. It was higher in their motives, so it's probably not surprising that in terms of the impact, they say it's higher in the impact. Actually, everything else is pretty similar. The amount of time spent outdoors, possibly slightly higher for females and males. And here's the key, actually. How much you feel part of a community is higher in females than males. Mental health is higher in females than males. And confidence is higher in females than males uh, in terms of proportion. And this ability to be active in a safe environment. And that comes through in the comments, quite a few women saying, I can go here and I can feel safe uh, running on my own. So what about the, the inactive community? Very similar, you know, a high sense of personal achievement. Um, amount of time is spent outdoors, you know, pretty high. But look down here, your ability to be in a safe, uh, active in a safe environment. That's really important in terms of impact uh, to people who were previously inactive. And again, looking here, mental health. Mental health is improved uh, by at least 70% for those from, who were previously inactive. You know, quite a lot of the time, uh, an impact they weren't expecting. Here's our deprived community, uh, very similar uh, along to the inactive community, you know, large proportions saying their mental health has improved, ability to be active in a safe environment. So those from deprived neighborhoods. And then here's our kind of collection of people who are inactive and from deprived community neighborhoods as well. And I think the key things here I'd like to point out is the amount of time to spend outdoors, mental health is uh, improvements is very is very large proportion confidence a large proportion and ability to be active in a safe environment parkrun providing this uh, for people um there were some other questions some other answers as i said uh, so these are the remainder that were over the page and i suppose the key one here overall lifestyle choices eg diet and smoking how's parkrun impacted on that and we've got about 50% saying that their lifestyle choices have improved overall. And the cohort that see, you know, that the, that sees the largest proportion improving, 63% of those from active and deprived communities, seeing their lifestyle choices changing for the better. So really quite impressive um, public health impact of Parkrun. Um, I said that you can volunteer at Parkrun. Uh, this is just a comparison between running and walking and volunteering. Um, just so you can see, you don't have to run. People, a lot of people turn up and just volunteer. So sense of personal achievement, you know, pretty high, 70%. Despite it not being a cardiovascular, a cardiovascular kind of activity, volunteering, you're still getting more than 20% saying the fitness has improved. And, you know, 25, 30% saying the physical health has improved. A lot of things are almost as high as uh, running or walking, but this one I think is really interesting. For those who just volunteer, more of them feel part of a community than if you run. And the number of new people you meet, more of them meet new people than if you just run. So if you've got patients, if you've got colleagues and they're feeling not part of a community and they want to get to know people, Parkrun is a fantastic way uh, to do that. So here I'll just leave you again with some thoughts from people. This is from the 600,000 words uh, in their own words. I've run through pregnancies soon after giving birth through cancer treatment and to fix a bad back. In each case, my overall health has improved. And without parkrun, I doubt I would have done any exercise at those times. Here's another one. I'm in grief after traumatic and unexpected death of my son earlier this year. Running generally, including parkrun, in which he was a participant and volunteer, has been a lifeline and a therapeutic experience. And I'll finish off with this one. Uh, parkrun has improved the quality of my marriage and family life. My wife, children, and myself enjoy having a scheduled time each week where we participate together. 
All petty squabbles and disagreements are washed away by the feeling of collective achievement each Saturday. So just three sets of comments which tell you what Parkrun um, is about. So I'll, I'll stop there with the presentation. We shouldn't forget that there is junior park run. Here's our Olympic Legacy Park in Sheffield where we have a junior park run in one of the most deprived parts uh, of, of the city uh, growing, going great guns. Um, you'll have seen a little uh, tag down here, awrcparkrunresearch.wordpress.com. That's where you can find all the data, the reports with all the data and I've just shown you is, is in there. And Okay, I'll just finish off by saying how you can get involved. So we have a lot of uh, practitioners uh, there. We have people who can engage others. And I think, you know, if you've been before, please do come back uh, to Parkrun. If you've never been before, I, I really suggest you give it a try. It, it isn't for everybody. There are some people who don't like Parkrun, surprisingly, but for a lot of people, it really does some good. Um, Encourage your family and friends to take part once you've figured it out for yourself. Uh, promote park within, within the university, your college, your workplace. And if, if you are interested, based an academic project or research study on Parkrun. We're always looking for research studies. And again, uh, you can see how to do that uh, at that website below. Um, one thing I would like you to do is speak to your local event team and offer to be a Parkrun practice champion. Let's see if we can get the number of Parkrun practices up um, even higher than it is already. And also encourage as many GP practices as possible to become Parkrun practices. Share stories and case studies on social media. And really, I think it's about education all around um, about this particular public health initiative. So I will stop there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you, Simon, for such great presentations. So before we go over to the questions, let's launch that poll again. So there we go. So I'll give you 30 seconds just to answer that. No pressure. Okay, there we go, 94% yes, that's up from 72 I think. Yeah, yep. great, um, and, and just so you know, we do know your addresses, so we will be following that up. <laughs> great, so we've had lots of questions through on the Q&A, so <laughs> should, we, should we start off by answering a few? So, um, Simon, I see you've marked a few of those questions. So, should all, we start... all, the, all the easy ones. <laughs> yeah, no, perfect. So, should we start with the first one, which is, is there any scope for Park Push to make the program accessible for new mums with buggies? Oh, it's already happening. Um, mums and dads um, are welcome to come down with kids in buggies. We have loads at Southport Park Run and absolutely love it. And what, what a brilliant way to you know start a, a weekend. Come come down with your baby, meet other young mums, young young parents down there. So yes, you're welcome to come down and run with a baby in a buggy. Please do. Uh, and I'd just like to say, you know, in terms of the comments, you know, we've looked at pregnancy uh, as, as a cohort. We had about a thousand mums who filled in our, filled in our survey. And, you know, um, uh, these women, they, they ran, you know, as far as they could throughout pregnancy and started park run after uh, pregnancy um, as quickly as possible. And Andy Shannon, who's on our park run research board, has actually used park run um, to do some research about pregnancy and running. And if you want to find out the, the findings of that study, that's also on the website. 
Super, thank you. So the next question we had was, in setting up a new park run, is it better to engage with local GP practices from the outset before the event launches, or does social prescribing work better after the park run has been up and running for a while? I don't think it matters. that There are many ways to, to skin a cat. What matters is enthusiasm. And that's what really counts in a core team is getting together a group of like minded individuals who are just passionate about starting a park run in, you know, in their area. So if anybody is interested, if you just let us know at Park Run, we can help and support you start new events and new events are just starting all the time. Um, so it doesn't matter how you do it. If you want to involve a practice that's enthusiastic, great. If you can't find one, it's not a problem. It's just about people's energy. Um, and if you have the energy and the motivation, go ahead, please do it. Great, thank you, fantastic. So the next question is um, from Andrew Power. So he's asking, have Park Run identified any groups who can't participate and have they considered what is needed for such people? Right, okay. Well, it says Simon Tobbs is going to answer this question live. Oh, no, 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 no. I was just, just flagging it up as a good question. I, I assume that would be you, Steve. Yeah, oh, oh right, okay. But, 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 but I, may, I may chip in after. Well, well, I'm sure, I'm sure Simon, um, it'd be interesting to see what Simon says, because I don't know what he's going to say here. But, but from our data, if you look at who does uh, park run, then um, if we look at the, the demographic, um you do find that we have quite a lot of middle-aged people so it goes from you know four up to i think the oldest one is 92 i think that i've seen um we have a bit of a bulge a middle-aged bulge literally in terms of the population tree um so we do get a hangover years at kind of the age 18 to 22 so so those are the the least amount of people that register and turn up in terms of you know, it's, it's going to be the obvious ones. You know, we have fewer people who are inactive turning up than people who were more active. And we have fewer people from deprived neighbourhoods turning up than people from less deprived neighbourhoods. And that's despite having lots of park runs in those neighbourhoods. Those park runs tend to be smaller and have, you know, trouble attracting large numbers, shall we say. And it's not to say we're not doing something about it. We are, you know, looking at those barriers. Uh, but I'd be interested to know what, what Simon has to say, because I'm sure he's come across that personally. Yeah, it's um, I, I, I think I'm, I'm passionate about trying to get people from all walks of life involved in, in physical activity and anything that breaks those down those barriers is, is, is really, really important. I think running used to be seen as a kind of a white middle class sport activity i think that's changing i think parkrun has led on that just increasing diversity and inclusivity um i met recently or not recently it was last year now that the um uh, the ugandan crew from the burgess park run a, a group of people immigrants from uganda who, who had sort of migrated towards the local park run in burgess park and oh my goodness they were an amazing bunch of people um and they all met up uh, and it was a really important part of their social life down at burgess park run I was also been fortunate enough to do a couple of park runs within the custodial estates in, in prisons. And they're just the same as park runs, you know, on the outside. They start at 9 a.m. on a Saturday. The numbers are smaller and logistically there, there's some real challenges to, to getting those set up. But imagine, and I can only just, just begin to just think what it must be like to come out of prison, possibly to a new area, to relocate. You've got no friends, no social relationships. You may not have a, uh, may not have a job. And, you know, you're wondering what on earth to do, how to, you know, how to get in contact with a, with a community. Well, your local park run is a fantastic opportunity. You've got a barcode, you know the thing, you just rock up at 10 to nine to your nearest park run and, and off you go. And again, there have been some astonishing stories of people who have come out of, of prison and engaged with park run and it's made a huge difference to them. So even people in the, you know, the hardest to reach communities are welcome at park run. I've also just a third thing I've just thought of. Uh, there's a couple of park runs have been set up within the grounds of hospitals, um, and um, uh, s s some uh, s some sort of uh, psychiatric units as well. So, so I think that's a really really interesting avenue um, to explore in in the months to come. And actually, if I can just add on uh, that, in terms of what Parkrun is doing very successfully, is that that inactive group is increasing year on year and it's increasing increasing by about 
uh, one, just less than 1% uh, per year. And the most active as a proportion is going down um, by, by an equivalent amount. So, so they're doing really well on that. So what, just coming back on Steve's inactive comment, see, I'm not interested in getting people like me running more. I probably run too much anyway. What I do really get my kicks from is getting people who aren't moving or who move very little to do, do just a bit more. Now, my course at Southport is pancake flat. When you look at it in terms of the quickest times on the course, it's one of the, I think it's the 15th quickest park run in the UK. But when we rank them by the average finish time, mine is right down at the bottom. It's one of the slowest average finish times in the UK. And what that tells me is that I'm getting and we're getting the people that I really care most about, the people who aren't active down there who are coming to walk, maybe jog very, very slowly or doing a mixture of, of, of jogging and walking. Um, and those are the people who we can make the biggest impact for. Everybody's welcome, but particularly people who aren't moving or move very, very little stand to benefit the most. Great. Thank you so much. So our next question is, do either of you have any ideas on how um, people can kind of help to increase motivation to get started? So this question came from Ruth, who is a social prescriber, and she said often um, they find it difficult to motivate clients to sort of take that first step. So do any of the volunteers offer a welcome to new starters or do you know of any other kind of opportunities? Steve? Go on, Simon. Um, well, I, as you've seen, regularly will meet my patients down at, at a park run, if that will help, um, just to have a friendly face, someone they know at the start or encourage them to to bring down the friend i know there are groups as well um that will arrange to, to make people at park runs take people to to park runs and now we've got social prescribing link workers um in every primary care network in the country so so and attached to every single general practice in the uk that's a wonderful opportunity for, for them to actually introduce people to to park runs I would certainly, yeah, I mean, that, that's just fantastic. And what I would say is that one of the things that I found from the research is this advocacy thing. So if there are other people they can speak to that have done it already, or if you're the social prescriber, you kind of need to have done it to say, look, it's like this, this is how it works. And um, because there's a bit of fear when you turn up. I mean, I remember the first time I turned up at a park run, I thought, what, what is this? I don't know what's going on here. Um, and I was a little bit nervous. So if you've got lots of problems, you know, that, that could be really exacerbated. So, so certainly going with a friend, uh, finding someone else uh, that can help you on that, on that day, like Simon does with his patient. Great, thank you so much. So the next questions, I'm just going to combine two questions into one. So we've got a couple of questions from students. So the first is, do you have any resources for physiotherapy students? To get involved with park run or to chat to patients about park run and the second is from a medical student asking what we can do to help um, at park runs and to spread the word so oh. i think that's mainly about resources and how can we spread the word about park run okay uh, resources everybody not just gps are welcome to use the resources of the park run practice toolkit it, it we've adapted it and developed it, developed it chrissy wellington has been brilliant with this for, for use by by everybody so feel free to use the resources and um and, and tweak them great thank you do you want Super. to say anything steve uh, yeah what he said <laughs> <laughs> Oh, all right. And I think we'll just ask one more question. So this follows on quite nicely, um, Simon, from what you were saying about the fact that you sort of regularly go down to the park runs. But um, a question about whether there's a danger of professional boundaries being crossed when you're inviting patients to park runs and then sort of socialising afterwards. Um, this question was particularly thinking about female doctors. So how, how do we protect ourselves whilst being human and encouraging people to attend? It is a really, really good question and I've changed my position on this over the 35 years I've, I've been a doctor. Um, first and foremost you, you must keep yourself safe obviously you mustn't take any risks you must never do anything that you don't feel comfortable doing and as a professional doctor, nurse, physio you, you must have your pro professional boundaries there. However I have found over the time I've been a GP that I'm a better GP when I reveal more of myself 
more of what I'm like as a person, as a human. And when I stop regarding my patients as patients and I start regarding them as people and friends. Now, I don't go around to my patients' houses for dinner or tea or st stuff like that, uh, you know, but having a chat to them at a park run and saying, how are you getting on? And we, we, don't, and we don't even talk about the medical stuff. You know, did you have a good run? Or, you know, isn't the weather good? That's that sort of stuff is really interesting. And it's changed my relationships with my patients. And I regard regard them more, much more as people. It makes makes them more human because those barriers that I'd put up turns out were to really to protect me. And actually letting down those barriers and engaging as two human beings with similar, you know, possibly similar interests or overlapping interests makes a real difference to that, that relationship. And it helps me connect better with my patients. But you need to be really, really careful. And it's, it's a potential minefield. So, so you have to take care and you have to be sure about what you're doing. Super. Thank you. I'd just like to draw people's attention. So um, Helen Quirks put a, a, a link uh, in the yeah. chat box about Strive for Five, which is Parkrun's kind of couch to 5K program. And, and, and people going down to Parkrun, it could be quite a challenge for some people to do a full 5K. So couch to 5K is one way of training, but also Parkrun has its own kind of way of getting into, you know, walking at Parkrun. Fantastic. So I'm sorry we didn't get to answer everyone's questions. If you do have any, please do direct them to um, the social prescribing scheme email address and we'll be able to sort of direct you and hopefully answer some more questions if you do have any kind of burning ones. So that leaves us to thank you for attending this third instalment of our social prescribing webinar series. Um, thank you so much to Stephen Simon for such a fantastic um, talk. I'm sure I'm not the only one who is just raring to go for when park runs are, are back and really, really can't wait. Um, thank you very much again, just for, sort of for kind of painting such a, a vivid picture, both emotionally and also scientifically, I guess, of how sort of exercise and activity and park runs can be sort of so important in people's health, but also in the future of social prescribing. It's really important. So what we would like is if you could um, complete the feedback form and that's going to launch automatically for you at the close of this Zoom session and there'll be a link which will be emailed to all of you um, at the close of this um, webinar by the Royal College. Um, if you complete this, then you will receive a certificate of attendance, which is very nice. So just before you all sign off, um, we just want to let you know about our final webinar in the series, which will be next Wednesday, the 3rd of March, and we're going to um, have a fantastic panel of student champions um, of social prescribing who are going to be telling you about how you can get involved in social prescribing. Um, and it should be a really great session and we really hope to see lots and lots of you there, if that's okay with you. <laughs> so. We are hosting this webinar series in the lead up to International Social Prescribing Day, which, as I'm sure many of you are aware, takes place on the 18th of March this year. Um, and we'd really like to see you there and sort of virtually commemorate the day with us. We would really like to kind of hear your stories of how social prescribing has helped people to stay connected during the pandemic. And I think Daisy shared some links. Um, and please do follow us on Twitter, for example. Um, so that you can sort of celebrate with us on the 18th. So thank you once again um, to Simon and Steve. This has been such a wonderful presentation and evening and to Chrissy, to Alice and to Evelyn for help organising this webinar. So thank you very much. Have lovely evenings, everyone. Take care. See you at a park run soon. Yeah, see you at park run. Bye.